Guys, what's up? What? Oh, hey, Steve. What are you guys up to? Not much. We were working on a project for our diversity, but now we're stuck. Uh, diversity? Come on, guys. Diversity is simple. Diversity is like this hamburger, if I may. We need to recognize the individual differences of each topping. The crisp green lettuce, the ripe tomato slice, and the tangy ketchup, and of course the juicy, luscious hunk of beef. These differences deserve acceptance and respect. I respect you. Mm. This burger is beautiful in its own way, but completely different from this taco. Both are equally delightful. Though we have these differences, we need to work together. Look at those nuggets. Crisp and tasty on their own, but they taste even better when they're in something like barbecue sauce. Mm. I know what you're thinking. Hmm? Is America a melting pot? It is indeed a salad bowl. A combination of gender, ethnicity, religion. Wait, is that it? Yep. Please leave, Steve. Welcome back, I'm Michael Steiner. And I'm Rebecca Vargas, and this is our part two with Mike Donahue. We're in our week two, and we're gonna be talking about diversity. But first, I wanna talk about your Reinventing My Normal, the book which we talked about in last week. And tell us just a little bit about it, and what made you write it, what's inside? Well, I wrote this book um, as an answer to a lot of questions that teenagers were asking. Mm -hmm. um, I believe one of the, as a communicator, one of our jobs is to answer questions that they're asking. So. Um, if they're not asking questions, they're usually bored with what you're, you know, if, they're not, if you're talking about something they don't really care about, obviously they're going to be bored. So this is an answer to um, a lot of the, well, afterwards when I, when I talk about diversity and I talk about self-esteem and some of the things that we talk about in the schools, it stirs up a lot of emotion. So I ended up having conversations. So I wrote this book as an answer because I found myself giving a lot of the same answers to kids, you know, when after, like, mm -hmm. at, against the bleachers or, you know, uh, where we sell merchandise, so, you know, that kind of stuff, just standing there and, and giving the same answers. So this is uh, basically all that compiled into one thing. And it's step by step. It's not just hype. It's a lot of um, how do you forgive your, you know, people that have hurt you? Who do you trust? Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you live your life um, different if you've been scripted to live a, a different way? Like if you're a kid that grew up in a bad neighborhood and, and people pretty much script you to be a loser, how do you how do you in your mind change that? So this is 
just practical steps on and how to deal with that. And it's been in some schools too, you said, right? Yeah, we use it, they use it in uh, some psychology classes and that's pretty cool. yeah, wow. it's really, really weird. It's good impact yeah. though. <laughs> so when you're, um, when you're speaking at all these conventions in schools and you're talking about diversity, what's the main subject that you're talking about there? Well, I, I really believe that, I think I said this last week, unless you, um, unless they discover it, they don't really own it. Mm -hmm. So what I try to help kids understand is that you're not the only one in your school. You're, you're walking down the hallway, you've got kids that have gone through pain. One of the things that I talk about, I, I went through a personal issue where um, I was a sophomore in high school, I ended up in the hospital because of a domestic situation. The next day was the hardest day of my life because I had to walk down the hallway of the school and I had to act like I was okay. I had to put on my stage face and, mm -hmm. and pretend. And, and basically, if somebody had walked in my shoes that day, they probably would treat me different. And so my goal when I go into school is to help people understand that the, there are people with stories there, with lives. And, and it's, it's easy. I can just go ahead and label you. It's easy just to take one look at you and, and label you for what, what I see right now. Mm -hmm. It's like it's pretty cheap and easy to do that. You know? mm -hmm. And that happens all day, every day. On, even on college campuses, it happens. We, yeah. we do that everywhere. We mm -hmm. take one look at somebody because it's a lot. It's emotionally laziness is what it is. It's, it's emotional laziness. We, we don't want to look into someone's real life because mm -hmm. it's easy for me just to put a, slap a label on you and, and go from there. But ob on, you know, obviously we know that there's more to people than what you see on the outside. So what I'm trying to do in a high school context is get them to understand that you know, there are the, the kid that you call a slut or the girl that you call mm -hmm. a loser or emo or goth or whatever, there's a story behind that mask or label or, or stage face, whatever metaphor you want to use, but there's, there's a story behind that. Yeah, I know when a lot of people hear the word diversity, they tend to think like anti-racism or, um, you know, accepting, like being accepting, but is it, seems like what you're saying so far, it's more than just that. Can you it's touch that, on that? Yeah, it's that and everything, it, whatever differences, you know, if someone in a, in a high school context, though, it's, it's very narrow, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Mm -hmm. So there is race, there's, there is racism, and there, there is, um, but, I, but I go beyond that and talk about just the, the classes of people that we, we, you know, we put people, people into classes. I found a, a quote from Johnny Depp. He mm -hmm. said that we have to give people labels because that's where we put the price tag. And, you know, obviously he's saying that sarcastically because not only do we label somebody, whether, whether it's, you know, black, white, whatever, mm -hmm. or goth, slut, yeah. all the different things, we, yeah. we assign a value to them. And that is, to me, that's more detrimental than anything else. Because we talked about that last time. Basically, there's people in that school or in that work environment or in that college campus that buy into that social value. So they, they go right with it. So they, they depend on it. And they get sucked up into a cycle. And my opinion is, on every campus, whether it's college, high school, um, there's an underground, it's the way adults, there's two levels. It's mm -hmm. the way adults think kids are living and the way kids are really living. Mm -hmm. Even on this college campus right here, I'll, I'll guarantee you that yeah. there's, there's what everybody sees and there's what really happens. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to what's really happening. Right. Because that's where all the stuff's going on. Mm -hmm. So how can we go about um, learning about other people and, and even, even as mentors maybe teach kids to accept others and as kids, how do we go about breaking down all these labels that we put on each other? MTV came out with that show, you know, um, If You Really Knew Me. Oh, If You Really Knew Me, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. I saw that. And I, I like that show because that's what we've been doing in schools for the last you know, eight years is helping kids really understand the story, you know, mm -hmm. behind each individual. So mm -hmm. what I do is I hold up a shoe and tell a story. And I'll say I met this girl. Can I tell a story? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I don't have her shoe with me, but um, I met this girl, I'll pretend. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, this girl came down off the bleachers and she walks up to me and she was, you know, she had the cheerleader thing going on, she had the outfit on and yeah. she had little ribbons in her hair. And some people, some people are just born to be cheerleaders. You know, yeah. they come out of the womb going, yay, doctor, go. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So she, she was sort of like that, you know. But yeah. then when she stood in front of me, she was like, she goes, um, I know, she, basically she goes, do you want to know what my label is? And I'm like, I'm like I was thinking perky, you know, something. Perky. And so I just kind of stood there and she goes, everybody in the school calls me a slut. And then the smile on her face just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so I stood there and I, I said, why they call you that? Mm -hmm. And she said something to me that nobody, ever, usually people will tell me the story right there, but she didn't. She said, she goes, I'm not going to tell you here. She goes, I don't want to cry in front of these people. 
She goes, I'll email you tonight. So that night, I get this email. I was in, I was in that town for a couple days because I was doing the junior highs too. And she's, I, get, I get this email, and it's unbelievable. I'm not going to exp- describe what's on this email, but this event that happened in this girl's life is awful. One of the worst things I've ever read in my life. And so the next day, this never happens, but I got to see her again because the football team was going to state, and their coach called me and asked me to come give a little motivational talk to the team, whatever. So yeah. I get there. She's there because she's a cheerleader, and she walks up to me, and she hands me. Well, first she says, did you read my email? And I said, yeah. And so she hands me the shoe, and on the side of it she wrote, looking for love in all the wrong places. And if I had a superpower, I think this is what it would be. I would... I would go to that school, find the kids that are calling her that name, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't yell at them because I'm not mad at them. Because I understand that. I get it. I understand why people do that. Mm-hmm. But I would try to help them grow up a little bit. I would sit them down, I'd take the shoe, put, put it on their foot, and let them experience her worst day for 30 minutes. They're not going to vid- you know, read a book or watch a video on it. They're going to actually be her for 30 minutes. And I'm going to guarantee that they won't come back to school next day and call her that name. Mm-hmm. There's no way they would. Because now they, now they know. Now they walk in their shoes. And that's what needs to happen on all levels. We need to understand what it's like to be that person. And it does. It changes your perspective. It really does. Yeah. And to talk about um, toleration in a certain sense, um, is there a difference between you know, accepting people and, and really trying to understand who they are and walking in their shoes and then tolerating this whole idea that we hear in the United States all the time? It's tolerating everybody and accepting everybody the way, like, how they act and what they do and like, just leaving your own faith and beliefs. Is there a difference there? Well, I, personally, if I'm talking to you and you have a difference of opinion on something with me th- than I do in my faith, if I'm in a position to teach you something, if you're giving me permission mm-hmm. to, to talk to you, about something, then I, I'll take that. And I will share with you my opinion. Mm-hmm. But, I'm, but I'm sharing you with my opinion. I'm not bullying you. I'm not telling you if you don't believe my way, you know, something bad's going to happen to you. I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you how I believe. And I think that's just respect. Yeah. I think a lot of, um, a lot of times we, we bully people into, into our philosophy. And I think it's out of insecurity because we, we, we want them to believe what we believe so we can validate what we believe. Well, I don't need to validate what I believe. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. Mm-hmm. And if you're giving me permission, and so my, my mind is a communicator, whether it's in front of an audience or as you sitting here in front of me, mm-hmm. my, most of my work is getting you to give me permission. So I know what I'm going to say. I know, I know what I believe. Mm-hmm. But I have to get into your head a little bit, and I've got to understand why you believe what you believe. And so I need to listen to you mm-hmm. and, and really care and come from the context of caring mm-hmm. about you. If I really care about you, you probably will give me permission to speak into your life on a subject, whether, you know, wh- wh- whatever that is, whether it's a dating relationship or, you know, your sexual orientation or whatever. I, but I ha- me as the speaker, the communicator, I have to earn the right Mm-hmm. to be able to talk to you. And I think a lot of times, no offense, but a lot of, a lot of people I've been around don't, don't take the time to build that kind of credibility so they can get the permission. So they never really talk to the issue. They talk right. to level three of that issue. Mm-hmm. Level five is the real issue, is where they live, where the pain in that issue is. But they're talking to you know, level two, level three on information only. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think that's effective. That's what it really means to mm-hmm. love your neighbor, I feel like. Exactly. Through that, that's what it really means. Right. When we come back in a second, we're going to be talking to Mike more about this issue of diversity, so don't go away. My name is Vanessa Leaf, and I'm a Puerto Rican Jew. When I was seven years old, I got really sick with spinal meningitis and I was in the hospital and basically the doctors told my parents that I wasn't going to make it. And my mom just immediately went to the Lord and just started praying that if the Lord would spare my life, that she would raise my sister and I to know him no matter what it took. And so within the hour of that prayer, my, I completely turned around. The doctor said I was completely fine, came out of that no problem. And my mom started taking us to church. So we started going there and my dad loved it because it was Jewish and my mom loved it because Jesus was there. And me and my sister loved the dancing. We've been raised in Messianic Judaism ever since. I had a bat mitzvah at 13 
And so basically what that is, is it's a coming of age. You get trained in two different aspects. One is kind of a mentoring and a growth in your relationship with the Lord and kind of taking ownership of that. And then the other is learning Hebrew and you know, really just being able to understand why we do liturgy, which is different prayers in Hebrew and things that come out of scripture. It's a coming of age of owning, okay, this is now something that I'm going to take and lead for the rest of my life. Basically, Messianic Judaism is a matter of keeping the richness of my culture and who I am and you know my blood while at the same time accepting the truth of who Jesus is. A lot of Christians have a hard time understanding the aspects of Judaism because they weren't they weren't taught that you know in the church. There was a lot of anti-Semitism that was around when Christianity started. So the aspects of what has been taught even in replacement theology, you know, that the church has replaced Israel is so far-fetched and so not scriptural that, you know, I can't blame some people because they don't know any better, you know. So nowadays it's really just a matter of being able to partake in opportunities to educate Christians of, hey, this is what's scriptural, this is this is what Jesus did when he was here. Jesus was Jewish. And the reality is, is it's not about me being Jewish. It's the fact that Jesus was Jewish. We are married to the Lord. And so being married to the Lord, there's intimacy that comes out of getting to know him for who he really is. And the way that he chose to live on this earth is at, in a Jewish lifestyle. So being able to understand different feasts and festivals and different ways that made him who he is and the Jewish traditions and, and everything like that, I mean, it really brings a lot of richness and, and understanding to who your savior is. You're not gonna engage in the Lord only for part of him. You don't want part of him. You When you sing to the Lord, you know, you sing praise songs like, Lord, I want all of you. Well, this is part of him. You know, so really being able to experience all of him and knowing that you have a place in that. And we are one in the body. Like there is no separation. There is no distinction. We are all called to be one in the Lord. And really that's what John 17 talks about for the Jews and for the Gentiles to become one in the Lord. And once we really start to own who we are and function as the body is supposed to function, I mean, talk about a great second coming. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. We have some questions from the audience. So this audience member asked, um, why is it that you think that young people or people in general are afraid of people who are different from themselves? Because they're not comfortable with who they are. Okay. You know, the more comfortable you are with you and you know, being comfortable in your own skin, then you can tolerate other people. So that's always a sign to me that you don't really like yourself. If you're, if you're really critical of a lot of people, it's probably because you don't really like yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I think sometimes it's a coping mechanism you know, um, to follow up that, how do you, how do we get people to embrace others that are different from themselves? Like, how do you, how do you build a bridge between maybe like a cheerleader or, or an emo? Well, I, you know, I hear a lot of times kids will say to me, you know, I want to be, I want to be myself. You know, I, there's a, an illustration I always use or a quote, and I don't even know where I found them or I got this, um, but basically it says that everyone's born an original, but most people die as copies. Mm -hmm. And I think there's such a pressure in, in, in a high school context, for sure, to be a copy. You know, to, to look around and see what, what's the norm, who's, who's running the show, who, what's popular, what's cool, what's not. And, and there's this conformity thing going on. And, and people really want to be originals, but it's going to cost you something socially to be, to be an original. I'll give you a, a case in point. I was at a school in Pittsburgh. And this girl said to me, she sat down at the end of the program, she, she goes, everybody in the school is calling me weird. So in my head I'm thinking, I wonder if she is weird, you know, I wonder if she barks mm -hmm. at kids. <laughs> you know? But you know, I asked her, I'm like, well, why, why are they calling you weird? And she goes, she goes, well, to be honest with you, it's because I won't go to the, the cool kid parties. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, all the, all the cool kids, you know, are asking me to go to the parties and stuff, whatever. She goes, I decide not to. And I said, why did you decide not to? She goes, because I know what happens to sophomore girls who go to parties with senior boys. So somewhere along the, girl, along, along the line, this girl picked up a value, good value, mm -hmm. great yeah. value. I mean, I don't know if it was church, common sense, or parents. I have no idea where it came from, but she got this value. Well, that's great, but when she's walking down the hallway of the school, like wherever, wherever she got that value, okay, at home, church, like I said, that environment is probably conducive to the value. But that value is not conducive, it's not conducive in that school. When she's walking down the hallway of that school, that environment is counter. So she's walking down the hall, someone goes, you going to the party? She goes, no. Okay, why? They don't leave it there, they just go, they, you know, they're like, why? Well, because I don't want to go, and she may, well, I don't know what she said, but all of a sudden they're calling her weird, and she just, 
she just it just cost her something to be an original. Yeah. You, know, you want to be an original. Original means you, you you basically stick up for your own values and you walk out your own values. I'll give you a case in point with my son. He was in seventh grade and he lets me tell this story. I, t I tell I say this with permission, but he's a senior now in high school. But yeah. when he was seventh grade, he came home from school one day and he was upset. So I, I got in his we're fr we're close. So mm -hmm. I got in his face. I'm like, what's up? Mm -hmm. and he's like, nothing. I'm like, what's up? And he started to cry and he goes. All the kids in school are calling me gay. So I said, really? And I grew up in the East Coast, so part of yeah. me was like, oh, really, they are? Get the shovel. We'll take your, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, yeah. you know, so I was like, well, why? And he said, I don't know. And I said, okay. I, and I'll, I'll tell you what I said to him. I said, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to know that however you answer this question, I'm still going to love you. You know that, right? And he's like, yeah. I go, do you think you're gay? Do you think you're homosexual? And he looked at me, he was like a seventh grade boy. He was like, what in the world? You know, yeah. and he said, he goes, no, I don't think I am. I think I like girls. And then he was, you know, and that was kind of mad at me that I just made him tell me he likes yeah. girls, you know, basically. So I said, well, why, why do you think they're calling you gay? And he said something that changed my life in a way. He said, dad, in a way, it's your fault. And I'm like, what? Like, does my son think I'm gay? Like, what? I didn't get why he was, <laughs> you know, saying that. But he said, do you remember when I was in fifth grade and you sat me down and you talked to me about dirty jokes? And what it was, it was, you know, he was about to go to middle school, and I sat him down. He's got three sisters. So I said, listen to me, you're going to hear all kinds of nasty stuff. And he's going to a public school, you know, but they, they Christian schools too. Anyways, mm -hmm. another, yeah. another show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, he basically said that they were telling dirty jokes in the locker room. And, and, I, and I told him, I said, you know, if you laugh at those jokes, you're basically disrespecting the women that are in your life. I was trying to teach my son a value, yeah. a good value. Again, my home that environment is conducive to the value. Mm -hmm. But I sent them into a public school. So now he's gonna live out that value in the locker room. He sits down, they're all telling dirty jokes. They look at him, he's not laughing. He, he goes, Dad, I didn't stand up, I didn't say anything, I didn't you know, make a you know, public display, I just put my head down. So one of the kids noticed that he, you know, he wasn't you know, into it, so they said, well, you must be gay. And they went down the hallway saying, the new kid's gay, the new kid's gay. Well, that obviously really hurt my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I told him, I said, listen to me, you just proved to me that you want to be an original. Like that's, that to me is what it means to be an original, to, to be who you are. And, and no, that's not going to get a lot of respect in seventh grade in the locker room at that middle school. But I said to him, I said, by the time you're a senior in high school, if you stick to being original, we always respect the original more than the copy. So let's say in that locker room that day, there's six guys, my son, the kid who said it, and the four people watching. I will guarantee that the four guys watching wouldn't say this verbally at that point, wouldn't, but in their head, they have way more respect for my son mm -hmm. than they do yeah. for the copy, for the kid who said it. And I think that's what goes on all day, every day in a school. We, we look around and go, because in junior high, it's all about who likes you. In high school, it's about who respects you. And especially in your junior, senior year, you're looking around to see who do you, who do you respect and, and why. And I said to him, I said, by the time you're a senior, you're going to have a lot of respect. And I just did his school in September, and I was walking on the hallway with him, and he does. He has incredible respect but for those, from, from that student body because he is who he is. And I think that there's a maturity issue. It's not just how do we get them to. Sometimes it's just maturity. They have to grow up, and, and deep down, we really do respect the person who, you know, who, who is going to be an original. So my, my goal is to get the kid to be the original. You know what I mean? To get to be an original, be who you are, stand up who you are. You're gonna take it on the chin. If you have values, especially Christian kids who are walking out in a Christian school, I mean a public school, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna take some heat. But ultimately, those people really do respect you for walking out who you are. They may not agree with your philosophy, your your theology, whatever, but they look at you and go, Wow, they got the guts enough to be, you know, who they are. Yeah. And how, how do leaders get this idea into kids' heads? I mean, as a parent, it's kind of, it's kind of easy because you live with them and you can hammer it into your son. But how does like, maybe like a youth pastor or, or even somebody that's mentoring a, a, a younger person, how do, they, how do they get that idea into them? I, I wrote this book called Talking to Brick Walls, and, and it's for youth leaders. And it's okay. basically that. How, how do we help kids in this social structure that they're in? First of all, as a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor for 18 years, you really do have to understand that the environment you're setting up in the youth group is conducive to your values, which you have to. I mean, you definitely, you want leaders that are going to endorse your values, you've, you've got, you want key kids in the youth group that are endorsing your values, but you have to understand when you send them into that school, 
that's not the way it is. So you got to get their back. You got to mm -hmm. be supportive. If my son had told me, Dad, I, I, I laughed at the jokes, I wouldn't have scolded. I would have said, Buddy, listen, I love you. Put my arm around him, you know, and go, Next time, let's, you know, do it better. Why? You know, I would have walked him through it. And I think that as a, in a youth pastor leader, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to walk them through being an original and standing up for their social va for their values and and again owning those values and I do think I think what it did with Keegan is it really solidified the value like he took the heat and it cost him something but he came out of it at the other end going you know what I, really, I like myself for standing up for who I am yeah. you know and that's what we have to kind of help them see that that's a very good thing to do. And that's what that's all about, that yeah. book. Awesome. Yeah. I have actually one more question from the audience. And they ask, is there any value in young people being vulnerable with each other? Would that diminish the problems of diversity if people were just vulnerable with everybody? Yes, it would totally change the game. But the caution on that is that, that you, again, have to set up the environment that it's safe. Mm -hmm. Because... I get worried sometimes that somebody would take some information out of the room and then and do more damage with it. Because, yeah. And that's with, with the help of you know, Facebook and all the other social media today, yeah. social networks and blah, blah, blah. That, that can get dangerous. I mean, social, uh, I mean, cyber bullying and all that stuff is becoming a real Huge. issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but I do think, I think the more intimate you can get in, in um, taking somebody like, you know, a goth and then pairing them up with somebody who's like the, the quarterback of the football team. I've done this before. I've, I've pulled the quarterback up, and I've pulled you know, kids from different diverse backgrounds up on the stage at a school. And I will say, I'll talk about them a little bit and say, well, how would you like to be the quarterback? And everybody looks at him and goes, oh, I'd love to be the guy that gets all the attention. Mm -hmm. But how about if you make a mistake on a Friday night, your name's in the paper. His name's going to be in the paper. He, he throws an interception in the last couple of seconds of the game, you know, he's, he's a jerk to everybody, yeah. you know what I mean? So how would you like that pressure? And I go down the line, how do you like to be this person? Blah, blah, blah. And then what I've done is I've, I've said, okay, listen to me. I want you, as a school, I want five guys to come that, that, that normally wouldn't get the back of the quarterback. Like, you, you're just not that, you don't hang out with the You're not his friend, you're just a guy in the school. Would you be willing to get his back? Would you be willing to walk in his shoes? And kids come up out of the audience, they come running out. And they'll get behind them, and it's a real emotional, awesome. emotional scene, yeah. Really cool. So how do you keep, like, in all these moments of, of vulnerability and things like that, you, you were talking about the dangers of it. What happens if somebody takes somebody who was vulnerable and, and destroys them? How do, you, how do you recover from that, or how do you protect them? Well, if the person that got it, the victim in that situation, I would, if I was the leader, if I was the mm -hmm. teacher or, or whatever, I would just let them know that, you know, you did the right thing by being vulnerable. We'll just mm -hmm. we'll be careful next time not to, you know, do it in a, you know, a situation where it's mm -hmm. going to leave you. You know, in a hurting situation. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And honestly, we've learned so much from mm -hmm. the past week and about diversity now. It's just incredible. It really is. It's fantastic. And we, we have um, your book with yep. us. Uh, where, can we, uh, where can we find out more about both of these books? R5online.com. Okay, that's where they can be purchased. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, great. thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us at home. And as always, don't forget to live, live it raw. raw.